Welcome to our Words in Progress series, where we get a mini lesson on writing from experts in the field. And here to teach us is Paula Munier, who is a writer, editor, teacher, and agent. Not busy at all. No. <laughs> She is quite the expert to have um, join us today. Here's the main thing I think we all need to know about Paula. She is a storyteller and a story seller, which I just love that. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been in the business for over 20 years and she's done a lot, if not at all. Um, so a few things um, and why she's here today. She's the author of The Writer's Guide to Beginnings, which I'm holding up if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, it's how to craft story openings that sell writing um, that's so sorry so that's one then the second one is writing with quiet hands I'm also holding this up I'm just reading this now for the first time and I love this I know me too I love this. <laughs> and then she also has written plot perfect how to build unforgettable stories scene by scene and this is a fantastic book we're gonna have to talk about this with you next year because because <laughs> that's a great one too um she is also a literary agent and a content strategist a senior agent at talcott notch literary services and um she also blogs at one of my favorite resources for writers which is career authors and in addition to all of that, <laughs> she has written three books in the Mercy Car series, um, which I have the first of here. Um, this, the first one was A Borrowing of Bones, fantastic read. The second in the series was The Blind Search. And coming out just at the end of this month, I think on March 30th, is The Hiding Place. Oh, and I read that. It's so, so good. Ooh, so I know. great. I know. And so, you know, I, here's a Paula. She has a mission to tell great stories and sell great stories. And why you might ask? Her answer is because the world needs them. <laughs> Paula, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. I love to talk about writing and writers and books. So here we are. Oh, oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, so, so today we're specifically talking about dramatic openings, mm -hmm. um, which Paula talks about in chapter yes, two of her book that Kathy is demonstrating right now. Mine here. is very well marked. A writer's <laughs> Guide to Beginnings. And um, so we're saying we just, our first question is of all the parts of craft, you chose to work on, begin you know, teach about beginnings, and we're wondering why. Well, you know, it's interesting. I do these first 10 pages boot camps for Writer's Digest University. Um, I, I did the webinar and our whole agency, every quarter we do it. So that means that people send in their first 10 pages and we, you know, divvy them up and we read the first 10 pages and we give them, and give them the critique. And they're very popular. And so Writer's Digest came to me and said, you know, we'd like to do a book based on the workshop because oh. beginnings are so important. You know, nobody reads past the beginning. Right. Agents don't, editors don't, readers <laughs> they don't like the beginning, they put it down and walk away and go watch Netflix or something. So, so it's very important to have a strong beginning. But I thought, oh, you know, I just wrote two books on writing. I'd written Plot Perfect. I'd written Writing with Quiet Hands. I thought, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> what could I possibly say? And then I had a client turn in a revised manuscript to me. And the original had had 14 points of view. Beautiful story, beautiful writing, but you can't. Just so you know, you can't sell anything by 14. a day 14 points of view. Okay. So <laughs> I told her and she didn't believe me, right? So, and I hadn't been an agent that long, so I wasn't forceful enough. And so I said, okay. So I sent it out. And of course, everybody said, well, this is great, but it's got 14 points of view. <laughs> okay. So, so I had to revise it. I said, you know, no more than five points of view. So that's kind of the rule, point of view. You just follow or, you know, you, you don't follow it at your peril. So no more than five points of view, the, predom the predominant point of view should be the protagonist. That's just sort of standard mm -hmm. you author stuff. So she sends me back the revision. And in the first like 5,000 words, there's five different points of view, <sighs> four of which are not likable people. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I said, well, I said, didn't we talk about this? You know, <laughs> and she said, oh, she said, but you know, I did what she said. It's only five points of view. I meant for the whole book, right? <laughs> and, and she said, and, you know, I, I modeled it on 
Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. And I went, oh boy. And George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. And I thought, well, first of all, don't use the F word with me. That's what I call Faulkner. I mean, <laughs> Faulkner's a genius, but there's only one of him. <laughs> and, you know, don't, you know, I can't sell Faulkner. So, so I said, okay, let's just put Faulkner aside because you know, he's a special case, right? Mm. I said, A Game of Thrones, yes. I said, well, you know, I don't remember that. So I went back and I reread the first opening chapters of A Game of Thrones. Now, George R. R. Martin is a genius too, just like Faulkner, he's a different kind of genius. But when I read it, I thought, well, yeah, he does change point of view. You know, first five chapters, first five, almost different point of view. But he did it so beautifully. He did it the smart way. So I sat down and I wrote this 3000 word thing about, look, analyzing in detail the opening chapters of A Game of Thrones and why the point of view changes work, blah, blah, blah. And so when I finished that and I sent it off to her, I thought, well, maybe I do have something else to say. <laughs> so I wrote the book on beginnings and that whole anal analysis, by the way, is in A Writer's Guide to Beginnings <laughs> on point of view. So, so I figured I did have more to say on, on uh, beginnings and I read so many beginnings between the workshops and manuscripts. I read a lot of beginnings and mm -hmm. I see where writers go wrong and you know, it's kind of like that song, that, that game show, Name That Tune, you know, I can do it in four notes. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't take four notes for us to say no. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you know, right there on the first page, you know, if that, if you're going to buy that book or not, they've done all these studies, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, how do buy, people buy books? Well, they look at the cover first of all, right? And whether it's a thumbnail or whether it's the actual book in the bookstore, mm -hmm. and if they recognize the type, the writer's name, that's half the battle. If they don't recognize the writer's name, then they look at the cover. Does it look like my kind of book? Does it have a cool title? They turn it over. They read the, the back cover. They read the jacket copy if it has a hardcover or jacket. Then they turn to the first page. That's where the buying decision is made. Wow. And if that first page confirms to them that this is their kind of book, they buy it. If, they, if it doesn't, they don't. And that, that's a 60-second buying decision right there. Wow. Right. So right. that opening has to rock. Yeah. I think that's one of the things I loved about when I, I read this book, I just, I got just really, really excited because you combine the business reality of writing and craft together. You know, often books have one or the other, but not the both. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I found that to be very appealing. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you have to remember that, you know, if you want to write commercial fiction, you know, then you have to be at least Commercial. acknowledge the business <laughs> right. Yeah. The right. of the marketplace. So, Okay, so in this book, you mentioned that as an agent, you receive about 10,000 queries a year. That's 10,000 queries a year. That's right. Oh my gosh. And, which is just a shocking number because if you take Paula as an agent times all the other agents out there, right? There's a lot of queries out there going around. And but you obviously even more revealing, I guess, than the 10,000 is how few you actually keep reading, you know, that you don't continue on. Right. And so you came up with a top 10 plus one list of why story openings don't work. So we're going to go through that today with you briefly as we can. We won't spend too much time on each one of them because we know people okay. just want to fly through sure. this. Sure. Okay. Okay. So number one is, and this, this list is in her book in chapter two. So you have to buy the book if you want more information on it. Um, Good but purchase. number Good one, point. not enough happens. Right. A surprise, you know, and a lot of openings are all backstory or they're all description. Nothing actually happens, right? So readers are waiting for the story to get started. They know it's not that if, it's, if you're giving us the history of London or the entire family tree of your main character, they know that's not the story. They know that's mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the lead up, but they don't, want, they don't want to bother with that, right? So they want to get to the story. We want to see something happening. And a, a m many, many opening pages, it's just backstory. It's just info dumping. It's meetings. I can't tell you how many stories open with meetings. We avoid meetings in our real <laughs> The one Why thing would, none of us want to do. <laughs> right. Why would we want to read about them? Even if they're taking pla place on planet XYZ among mm -hmm. aliens and there are a lot of science fiction fantasies starts that way at a meeting of the elders or whatever yeah 
of the alien right. nations, but <laughs> it's still a meeting, right? It's still boring. So right. next, the next generation of books will be. I mean, it doesn't have to start out every time with like an explosion or something right. like that. It just has to have something that's going on rather something than just. It has to happen. It could be a small thing, but it needs to yeah. be something. Right. Something interesting enough, I right. guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So number two, um, the story's genre is not clear. Yes. In the best stories, we know immediately. Um, and if you look at it, like I, I give a great example of the, the Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Mm -hmm. The opening paragraph, it's, it's in the book. I have a lot of great openings in the book. And mm -hmm. you know, it's just a description of the house, Hill House. And you know something really bad has been happening there <laughs> and it's going to continue happening. And you know that because of the language. And again, she, she's just a describing the house but the language she uses the right. tone the description it's it's horror it's mm -hmm. horrifying right so you feel that right away so you know it's horror if you open um 10 books in your subgenre you know it's bridget jones you know when you read that first page you know it's a rom-com Mm -hmm. You just know from the content, mm -hmm. sometimes it's actually what actually happens, right? If, if they drop a body on page one, you know, it's probably a murder mystery, right? Mm -hmm. um, or if, if, you know, it's a cute, a meat cute, or if mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, the, the language of a, a horror novel, a creepy language, you know, it's going to be a horror novel. So there are lots of clues. There are a lot of ways you can do that, mm -hmm. but you have to do it because the reader wants to make sure they're buying their what kind of and they're yeah. going to spend 30 bucks or whatever and 15, 20 hours of their life reading a mm -hmm. book that's not what they want. They won't do right. that. That's right. Okay, number three mistake <laughs> that your opening doesn't work is that it's not clear what the story is about. Right. So sometimes, you know, we as writers, when we're writing act one, we're sort of warming up to the story ourselves, right? Because we don't unless we've detailed it, really detailed outline, you don't really know what's happening, right? You're getting to know the story and the characters as you write it. So we're warming up. So for a lot of people, it takes about 50 pages to warm up. Mm -hmm. So for people where nothing's happening and nobody likes your opening and nobody asks to read more, go to page 50 and see if something happens. <laughs> right. That may be where you're, because a lot of people, it, it takes about 50 pages to warm up. That's sort of a, a, a thing, you know, just like, yeah. A lot of act twos are really muddy and a lot of act threes are rushed, right? There's sort of classic things we do that part of the writing process of finishing that first draft, you're going to find these issues. And with act one, it's almost always too much stuff we don't need, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. So, that, so that um, number, four, pages. <laughs> yeah. right. um, number four is it's not clear who the protagonist is. And oh. see, this kind of goes with number three they all kind of go together in my, my mind because I know this happened with mine. I was like trying to be mysterious. <laughs> so I was like, you know, who is this person? You know, whereas everybody <laughs> wants to know right in the beginning, you know, but I was like making that part of the mystery too, or something, you know? Well, readers want to know who they're supposed to root for. They want right. to know who, whose shoes they're going to walk in for the next 400 pages, right? And they want to like that person or at least admire that person. You know, they want to relate to that person because that's what reading is. It's a vicarious experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so we want to know whose journey we're on, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to know right away. I mean, sometimes, you know, there's a prologue or whatever, but, but the sooner we meet that protagonist and the sooner we fall in love with them, the better. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if you if you're making a choice between your first, um, like if you're in a, a traditional mystery, like you said, and and we're gonna have a body, so you know someone's gonna die, and introducing your protagonist, do you have kind of a rule that you like to see which one should come first? Well, often in a mystery, the detective or the sleuth is called to the murder scene, right? Mm -hmm. Now you a, a, a lot of times murder mysteries start with the scene of the murder mm -hmm. right but and that's and the protagonist isn't there the sleuth isn't there they come later but mer mystery readers know that they're like okay here's the murder we're going to meet the protagonist if you don't meet the protagonist in the next chapter they'll be like wait a minute where is it where where is where's our where's our sleuth you know so that yeah. goes back to genre then like you were right. saying it's all interconnected it, mystery readers know their genre and they know if there's a dead body the next chapter they're going to meet their protagonist or their right. sleuth right so so you you, you 
you have to at least acknowledge the genre conventions and every genre has them, right? Yeah. And if you don't acknowledge them, then you won't, you won't fulfill the reader's expectations. They're coming to a certain genre because they expect a certain kind of reading experience and they want that reading experience. So you can't fool with the experience. You can play with the conventions. You could tweak them, twist them, surprise us with them, but you can't ignore that. Hmm. Okay, that perfectly leads into number five. There needs to be something unique about the story to set it apart. Right, that, that, here, this is a trick. So what everybody wants is the same but different. <laughs> right? That's easy. That's, it's that's true, yeah. Say. That's what we say in publishing. In Hollywood, they say uniquely familiar, which I think <laughs> is the same thing, right? So what they want is insert bestseller here, the same, just like this, insert mm -hmm. bestseller, only different. And then you have to be able to articulate that difference and, and we have to be able to see that difference on the page. So when I shop a book, I know I have to be able to say, oh, this book is great for all fans of XYZ, but it's different because it's got this, right? Mm. So that's what you have to do. You have to find a way to make your, your story different. So take something like Darkly Dreaming Dexter. So here's a guy, what is he writing? He's writing <laughs> another serial killer story. We've seen a million serial killer stories. <laughs> But he's writing about a serial killer who only kills other serial killers. Mm. The same but different. Ethics. <laughs> and brilliant. It's like how brilliant can see, right? Mm -hmm. So and so character driven, you know? So mm -hmm. you have to find something like that. The same but different. So you can say, why would they buy your serial killer book when they could just read Hannibal Lecter over and over again? Mm -hmm. Well, they're gonna buy Dexter because oh, this is something different, mm -hmm. right? That's what you have to figure out about your story. And you have to show us that as soon as possible. Gotcha. Oh, next one. Um, the story is not grounded in setting. Mm. Yes. So setting is, is really important. You know, Eudora Welty said once that if you could set your stories anywhere else, you don't have the right setting. Oh. Your, your story should only be able to take place in this setting your given setting. And we need to know where the protagonist is. Need, so at, at every scene, the beginning of every scene, we need to know where we are and whose head we're in. Mm -hmm. Setting and point of view. And, and a lot of people neglect setting. I was terrible at setting. The first, writers, I, the first writers conference I went to, I was in my 20s. It was the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. It was lovely. It was beautiful Santa Barbara. And I had this wonderful, wonderful guy who read my pages. And he said, you know, these are really great. He was very encouraging. No reason to be, but he was very encouraging. <laughs> and, and then he said to me, but you know, there's no setting. And there was literally no setting at all. <laughs> None. And I think it was because I was an army brat and I moved around so much that I never paid any attention to setting mm. because it, it didn't matter. You know, I had right. to just move on. And, and now, of course, the reviews of my series, are, which are set in Vermont, they're all like, oh, she writes so well about setting. And I just have to laugh because I didn't even have setting at the beginning. But setting right. is very important. It should be nearly a character in your book. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that quote from Eudora Welty before, and it's going to make me rethink and double check my yeah. my current work in progress and be like, is this is is this really have to be? I mean, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. I mangled the quote, but, but <laughs> I just mangled what I said. So that. that's, that's what she was. Of course, she was great at setting. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Is this me? Okay. My yes. number seven. The protagonist is not likable or admirable and readers cannot relate to him or her. Ooh. Yes, you know, I, you know, you hear a lot about unlikable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, heroes and, and um, unreliable narrators mm -hmm. and all that. You do hear a lot about it and it's great if you can pull it off. Uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of a magic trick. And, you know, I, I'd say, you know, don't try this at home, especially <laughs> the first book. It's very hard to pull off because readers want to fall in love with their mm -hmm. protagonist. Editors tell me, oh, you know, I just didn't fall in love with the protagonist. And I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, what about unreliable narrators? And they're all the rage and I'm like, they're like, ah, eh. people still want to fall in love. So even if there's something, you know, we fall in love with Dexter, even though he's a serial killer, mm -hmm. right? We fall in love with him anyway. And so there has to be something, if not likable, at least admirable about the character. Take Sherlock Holmes who's kind of a jerk, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's not, but he's the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. We know he's a smart, we admire him. Plus, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is very smart. He does not write 
those Sherlock Holmes stories from Sherlock Holmes points of point of view. He writes them from Watson's point of view. And Dr. Watson is a very likable guy. He's a doctor. He's a war hero. He's right. fabulous. And he loves Sherlock Holmes. So we mm-hmm. see Sherlock through mm-hmm. his eyes and that helps too. But no, mm-hmm. we want to fall in love. Just like think of your favorite characters, the ones you read, the series characters you go back and back over and over again for. There's mm-hmm. something about them you love. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, huh. uh, you know what I don't like is when I f- fall in love with the character and then they kill him. Ah, <laughs> I'm like, what? That's that's George R. R. Martin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, yeah. It's that's kind so of funny because you know we're Game of Books, which is sort of a play on Game of Thrones. Right. You know, um, and uh, I think your publicist in the um, subject line called us Game of Bones. So oh, it was like a combo. That. I was like going, hey, that's, well, that's pretty really good funny. <laughs> you can tell she does a lot of publicity for mysteries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Saying, she was laughing and it was funny. Over your shoulder is a borrowing of bones. <laughs> your, your oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what she's got it in her head or something. My mm-hmm. first watch line. Yeah. My first that's awesome. party, we had these great buttons. Okay. Is it my turn? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, the story does not engage the reader's emotions. Well, you know, Uh readers read to feel something. That's Mm -hmm. what art's supposed to make us do, feel something, right? Mm -hmm. And and commercial fiction is no different. You Mm -hmm. know, there's a great guy, his name is Reed Farrell Coleman. He writes noir. Oh yeah. And he writes dark, typically dark material. And I heard him say once at a conference that what the emotion he is trying to evoke on page one is poignancy. Hmm. Isn't that interesting that a noir writer Mm-hmm. would want to evoke poignancy on the first page. But when you think about it, it goes along with everything else we're saying because poignancy is a very relatable mm-hmm. emotion. Wow. Right? It, I mean, it really hits you at, hits you right here. Right. Poignancy, right. And so what a good idea. And I, ever, I always remember that now. But you want to evoke some kind of emotion. Sometimes it's fear, mm-hmm. right? So if it's a comic novel, sometimes it's, it's uh, humor. It depends. But ask yourself what he because you want the reader to laugh and cry along with you right and if you can make them laugh or make them cry you will hear about it from your readers they will love Mm -hmm. you i had a couple Mm -hmm. reviewers for the new book the hiding place say oh you made me cry oh which i thought oh really i made you cry that's great i hope i made you laugh too but (laughs) no but it it was it was an emotional book and i didn't even realize until i'd read it that Mm -hmm. i finished it and the reviewers started talking to me about it, that it, what an emotional book it is. The, oh. the heroine goes on a very emotional journey. So, yes. you know, so ask it, and the readers love that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's cathartic. So, Art is supposed to be cathartic. Right? So Absolutely. when you, you had given us a list before, you know, every chapter or scene should be, you know, whose point of view, what setting, and now I'm thinking we should, I should add, what emotion am I trying to evoke to that mm-hmm. list? Milk mm-hmm. it, especially in the, in the subsequent drafts, go through and milk the emotion. Wow. Okay. All right. So this is a, this number nine is pretty funny because in the book it is listed. It's all showing and no telling. I cannot believe this. I did not realize that till till I, I prepared for this show because that of course is totally wrong. It's it's supposed to say it's all telling, not showing. Because <laughs> right. I was like, what? So, but you know, as I told my publisher once when I was act, I was running acquisitions for for a publisher and the publisher uh, finally read one of our books and got upset because there was a typo in it. And she made my copy editor, my copy chief cry. And I, I and my, and the copy chief was, you know, copy chiefs are like copy editors on steroids. They're the most, you know, particular meticulous people on the planet. <laughs> and she was crying and I felt so bad. And I said to, and I went to the publisher, I said, you know, you made her cry. And the publisher's like, well, there's a typo. I said, that's why God made reprint corrections. <laughs> so we will change that in the next printing. <laughs> it's supposed to say it's not all telling, it's all telling, not showing. But what's interesting about that is just today on careerauthors.com, which you so generously mentioned, we have Brenda Copeland, who's an editor, and she talks about show and tell. Because you know, mm-hmm. the, ad, the adage is show, don't tell. Mm-hmm. And she's saying you need to show and tell. And mm-hmm. I think that's absolutely true. So actually both things are wrong. And when I, when I do the reprint, I'm going to say showing and telling, right? Right. Oh. So, so I'd advise all of you to go read that careerauthors.com 
post on showing and telling because you do need a little of both, but too many people make the mistake of tell, 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 instead Mm -hmm. of showing, you need to dramatize your scenes. Right. Right. And I, I, that's so funny because when I read that, I was thinking the same thing because we've always heard, but then I was like, oh, maybe she's got some unique, like, you know, perspective. (laughs) No, that's not (laughs) But I like the one that it should be both. You're right. I mean, just not too much telling, you know? Right, right. Well, I often, even in my own work, but also in other clients' work, we'll get the notes back from the editor and the editor will say, we need more quiet moments. We need more, we need more inner monologue. We need more, you know, but that's because- That's how you can get to love that character too, you know? Right, and it gives you the roller coaster. So it's not just roller, 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 up, 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 and then crash at the climax. It's, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. Mm-hmm. Love it. Okay, awesome. and number 10, the story is not told in a strong voice. Mm-hmm. If anybody ever tells you you have a strong voice, you say, yay, 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 because that, <laughs> that is half the battle. Readers will follow a strong voice anywhere. They mm-hmm. really will. But the trouble is, um, you know, you can't rely on it too much to the detriment of other elements. But if you have a strong voice, that's important. If you don't have a strong voice, then you need to work on that. Because if, if you think about it, if you think about your favorite stories, we know Bridget, we love Bridget Jones. We fall in love with her voice. She's got a funny voice, Anne Lamott. Mm. You know, think of the opening of uh, Catcher in the Rye. We fall in love with his sort of angst ridden, you know, teenage boy voice, right? So it's the voice that matters because it's a voice telling a story. And sometimes readers, writers are either imitating other people's voices and so they haven't found their own voice yet or they just haven't found their own voice. So try to sound like yourself, only mm-hmm. better, you know? <laughs> I, I know. That's a whole nother subject. Oh, it, sorry, it is, Kathy. A, it is a whole nother <laughs> subject, but, 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 it, but if, yeah. if the voice is strong and we fall in love with the voice, we will keep reading. Even if the other elements aren't there, we think, oh, but this writer has potential. Mm. Right. They just have to learn not to rely on their voice so much because it's like mm-hmm. anything else. Your strength becomes your weakness if you use it too much. Right. Okay. right. Okay. Here's the bonus. Here's number 11. There's no narrative thrust. Ooh. Yes. No narrative thrust. This is what keeps a lot of good writers from getting published. And it, it's kind of an intangible thing, but it, it, at some level it boils, boils down to keep the reader reading. And keep the reader reading is really the only rule there is, right? Keep the reader right. reading. The other rules are, are there to support that rule, right? Mm-hmm. And, and narrative thrust is, is basically the forward propulsion of your story. And you do that with story questions. So you're, mm-hmm. every story has a big story question like, will she meet Mr. Wright? Or will they catch the serial killer? Or you know that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's the big question of the story. And then every scene should have a story question. And you should try to answer scenes on story questions, which is what my editor is such a stickler about. And now I am too, is ending on a story question so that you turn the page to the next chapter and the next scene. Mm -hmm. And then throughout that scene, you should sprinkle story questions. It's kind of like an engine. You have the engine at the front of the train, the big story question, pulling the cars, the scenes along, and those story questions pull each car along behind the engine. So you need mm-hmm. those story questions. You know, you were talking before about something about, you know, um, if you ha- you don't know what's, you were trying to be mysterious, right? Is that what you said, yeah. trying to be mysterious? Yeah. Okay. So the difference is you don't want the reader reading and thinking what's going on. Mm-hmm. They, should, they should know what's going on, but what's going on should ask, should prompt them to ask the question, what's gonna happen next? Mm-hmm. So it's not what's happening. That just means you've confused them. <laughs> right. It should be what's happening next, right? right? So ask yourself, you know, have you planted these story questions so that the reader's asking, ooh, that's interesting. What's going to happen next? You can, as a writer, you have to learn to anticipate the questions you're raising in the reader's mind as you go and answer mm-hmm. just enough of them while you pose more to keep them going. Right. 
that's what makes us stay up at night and not get the sleep we should when we're reading a good book, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And that's what we want for our readers. Yes. And that's what Paula did really well in her book yes. that's about to come out because uh -huh. I did read into the wee hours. In, in fact, I think I sent an email to you first thing in the morning because I had just finished it at like 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I don't know. I'm an insomniac, so I'm glad when I find a book like that, except I just keep reading and then, well. <laughs> good problem to have. So Paula, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such, I, I could have this conversation for hours. I just am riveted by all the information you have on here. If you are a writer, you need to go get this book I'm in amongst mm -hmm. the other ones as well. And um, w w do you have like maybe a little exercise that you can, you sh oh, that we sure. should do for um, finding that dramatic opening? Well, I, over the years belonged to a lot of writers groups and, and the last writers group I was in, I was a friend of mine. She had a contract, she was writing thrillers and she was turning in her second one to her editor and she still didn't like the beginning. She said, you know, I still don't like the beginning. And I said, okay. So we went to my bookshelf and I pulled off 10 thrillers and we, out loud, we read the first page of every one. She says, oh, I know what to do now. She went home, fixed it and changed it, sent it in. So wow. your best teachers are your comparable titles. Okay. And by this, I mean <clears throat> what publishers mean by pu comparable titles, which is books in your subgenre published in the last three years by up and coming writers, not mm -hmm. blockbuster writers who broke out into a different marketplace 30 years ago and just kept their audience, right? New writers. Find those writers, look at those opening pages, see what they do and how they do it. Mm -hmm. If you do that for 10, stories in your subgenre, you will know what that first page should look like. You will know the beats. You will know what buttons you have to push in the readers. Psyche. That's great. That's great. And that's fun too. <laughs> so we can just go to the bookstore and just keep reading first pages. <laughs> well, your, your competition, they're your best teachers. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I yeah. love that. Okay. Great. So Paula, Thanks. if um, our listeners have more questions about you and how to reach you, where's the best place to find you? Well, you can, you know, paulaminier.com. And then also I'm on Twitter at Paula S. Meunier. I'm on Facebook, Paula Meunier. I'm on Instagram. I'm all those places. <laughs> now my, my publicity team tells me to be. Plus I do like it. And, and if you, Twitter is fun. You know, if you go there for writing community, there's a lot of writers, writing community, active writing community on Twitter. And then Facebook is good for, for readers. A lot of readers mm -hmm. and a lot of crime fiction writers and readers. So you can find me, you know, I'm around. He's around. Right. And go to your website and there are, it'll direct you where to um, pre-order, maybe. They can pre-order. Oh, yeah, um, the hiding place. Yeah. Yes, the hiding place. Yes. Yes, the That's hiding it. place. Which got, I'm happy to say, it got starred review in Library Journal and was the pick of the month. Oh, right. awesome. Well, all I know is I, I, I think I, you know, I just want to live in Vermont and have big dogs. <laughs> That's after, I mean, I was like, you know, I live in a condo in Florida, so I can't have a big dog, but I was like, I love these dogs too. Uh -huh. Well, my, my children were here and they, they, but they're grown, of course. And they're like, you know, mom, the dogs in your books are a lot better trained. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. were very well trained. Very well trained. Yes. Army dogs. Mine are not army dogs, but they all are big rescue dogs, all big. And in the pandemic, we lucked out. We got a puppy, a pandemic puppy, and it happened to be a Malinois rescue. And a Malinois is the working dog, the military working dog, Elvis, is a Malinois in my books. And oh they're gosh. hard to find to rescue. And we got a rescue and we were so excited. And she is fierce. <laughs> she is a fierce dog. So it's great. I have a living, breathing Elvis in my house now. So. Oh, perfect. perfect. We have a, I have a neighbor across the street who we are, we're a big no, dog neighborhood around here. And this family adopted um, a dog during um, quarantine and they named it Q for quarantine. Oh, cute. Oh, cute. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paula. It's been such a pleasure and you Thanks. share a wealth of knowledge with all of us. Yep. Well, thank and, you. Great to be here. Hopefully we get to see each other in person sometime oh. in the next year. <laughs> Absolutely. Martini's on me. All right. Sounds wonderful. All right, Thanks. Cheers. cheers.